present and what's coming up in the few weeks or could we see Thursday and Friday. But also what's going to be of the future. There's a vision that's going to be that we're going towards from what are our next destinations? How are we going to get there? What is our what are we going to do when we get there? How do we make it possible to settle? How do we enable how do we improve the science we have through the through new space commercial industry? And what is the future once we get there? What's the promise that new space holds? That's what today's focus will be on. What, it, what is our goals? To begin today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Rasky, the director of the NASA Ames Space Portal. Dr. Rasky is, uh, is the senior scientist at NASA and, the head of, as I mentioned, the director of the Space Portal. He is the co-founder of it as well. The Space Portal has the goal of being a friend, friendly front door to emerging and non-traditional space companies here at NASA Ames focusing on, of course, making it more savvy, more getting the connections between NASA and emerging space much stronger. So without further ado, Dr. Dan Rasky. Thank you, Dan, and uh, welcome everyone to a Saturday morning here. It's nice to see all the true believers on a bright Saturday morning. And I'm, of course, particularly pleased to see Pete Warden has made time to, to be here. So I've got to be on my best behavior. So I'll, I'll try to do the best that I can. Um, what I want to talk about is the next big thing. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, several of my co-authors on this, Lynn Harper, uh, Bruce Pittman, who many of you know, and also Mark Newfield. And uh, what I want to do today, and particularly in the context of our current national um, situation that there's shuttle program has ended, uh, and there's a certain amount of distress about a debt ceiling, is to try to put something on the table of a, a potential, I think, attractive future. Because uh, it's times like this, it's easy to lose sight of what the future can hold. And I'm reminded that uh, it was actually during the Civil War that the Transcontinental Railroad got put in place. So when you have times of turbulence, there's actually t um, moments of opportunity. So I'm I'm hoping we can speak to that. So the next big thing I want to talk about is a flexible path to Mars with commercial opportunity and public benefits along the way. And this is actually a, a direction that we've gotten from President Obama, uh, the NASA authorization uh, that came out in 2010. And I want to put in place what we see right now, kind of a joint um, um, flexible thinking um, group that came together and we put some of our ideas on the table as to what we thought this flexible path to Mars might look like in the coming years. So I want to walk you through this. And this is how things stand today, okay, in 2011. Uh, we have a space station uh, that uh, is going to be with us to at least 2020, we hope. We have a significant launch capability, uh, both uh, traditional companies such as Boeing and Lockheed, as well as new space companies such as SpaceX. We have considerable uh, launch capability. SpaceX also has their uh, Dragon capsule, which you'll see like this over here. And I'm pleased to say that uh, Dragon is flying my heat shield. Elon made a very good choice on his heat shield material for Dragon. And uh, so I'm very pleased to see where, where it's at. And, uh, but this is where we things stand, and so where, what might the future hold? Well, there's one other piece that we need to put on the table is that uh, uh, we have a, a few issues, and one of them has to do with hazardous orbital debris, and it's a problem that has been growing over the years. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, uh, heard the news a few weeks ago when the uh, space station had to safe the astronauts into the Soyuz capsules because of a near pass of some, I guess, Chinese uh, debris. And so th this is a problem that we need to deal with to kind of clear the, clear the way to move forward. And one possibility for helping us with orbital debris is uh, the commercial space industry. And there's a number of commercial concepts that actually have come to light that may be able to solve this problem. I show one here, uh, an electrodynamic tether uh, that uh, a certain individual who's sitting in the audience here has proposed. 
And the very interesting thing about this concept is that it actually uses the Earth's uh, magnetic field uh, to help provide propulsion to clear debris. And it's one, one possibility. There's others that have been put forward. But uh, it's an, an opportunity for commercial entities to come in and help us with this, uh, this important problem. So here's 2012, and you notice the debris is starting to fade. Um, in the not too distant future, we hope to see a number of the Google Lunar X Prize teams operating on the lunar surface. And uh, the earliest that we've seen is 2013. The Google Lunar X Prize runs roughly right now to the end of 2015. But I think there's a very good chance uh, in 2013 plus time frame, we'll see a number of entities operating on the moon, which I think is gonna be quite exciting. So there we are at 2013. Okay, 2014, the uh, NASA commercial crew program plus uh, the private activities by SpaceX and other companies, I think we're going to see in the 2014 timeframe commercial public transportation to and from space. And again, this is going to open, I think, a number of different options for activities in space as well as uh, people to make money off of sending people back and forth to space. So there we are at 2014. Uh, NASA is quite interested in I, um, ISRU demonstrations on the moon, in situ resource utilization, essentially making use of resources at hand. And uh, there's a, a number of proposals uh, getting con serious consideration uh, within NASA, looking at getting both propellant as well as usable materials uh, from, from the moon. And, uh, we would love to see some of those demonstrations go forward, and we're hoping like in the 2015 time frame. There's 2015. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's also, of course, uh, Bigelow, and Bigelow is doing a lot of work with, uh, with private uh, space stations, and we believe that uh, that will continue. He's quite committed, and maybe you've had a chance to see Bob Bigelow talk about his activities. He's quite committed in, in his endeavors. He has the deep pockets to push it forward, kind of similar to what Elon's been doing with SpaceX. And so uh, we think that we'll, we'll, we'll see significant activity by the 2016 time frame. And there's a number of benefits uh, that can come from these stations and the type of in-space research they can do on microbiology and space biotech and so on, space nanotech, that we think will provide uh, significant benefits on terra firma here. And also, again, provide a number of different commercial opportunities for entrepreneurial and uh, another private industry. So there we are, 2016. Okay, 2016 plus. Um, lunar surface power beaming. There are a number of companies looking at this. We actually had some very good discussions with one organization called Laser Motive. They were the ones who actually won the centennial challenge for uh, power beaming propulsion. And uh, there are opportunities for using this laser power beaming to help provide essentially a, uh, a power infrastructure for the lunar surface, which again, many of you know, one of the challenges working on the moon is surviving a lunar night where it gets down to minus 150 C and the sun doesn't come up for two weeks. And so having some way that you can provide a power infrastructure for people who want to work on the moon at different locations is an important part of actually enabling uh, a number of different activities on the moon. So there we are with the laser power beaming. Depots. There has been considerable renewed interest at NASA in depots. Uh, I was part of a study actually that's going on right now uh, looking at depot architectures in contrast to all rocket architectures. And uh, we have found, uh, once again, that there are considerable advantages when you start looking at depots. And real briefly, if you're looking at going to destinations beyond LEO, roughly two-thirds of the mass you need to carry is fuel. So if you can buy that fuel on orbit instead of having to carry it with you in a very large rocket, um, you can reduce the size of your rocket by roughly a factor of three. And that means instead of 100 metric tons, you can get by with something on the order of 30 metric tons, which is much more in an evolvable class vehicle uh, compared to our existing capability with the Atlas V Heavy or the Delta IV Heavy. 
and it's significantly under uh, the proposed uh, Falcon Heavy lift capability of 53 metric tons. So there's a number of advantages uh, with depots. It also um, would provide a new market for commercial space companies and existing space companies to sell fuel to a government depot on orbit. Uh, we had some very good discussions with ULA about a year ago, and they told us that uh, virtually every um, Atlas V that is, that is launching today is launching several thousand pounds light on payload. They have excess fuel once the third stage is away and the second stage is in orbit. In fact, we had one gentleman tell us that on one recent uh, Atlas V flight, they were flying 10,000 pounds light. So you could have flown a Buick to space just because you could. And uh, what they did is they, um, they had so much excess Delta V once they had the payload away, they did a number of interesting things with the second stage. Took it to different orbits, spun it in different directions just because they had excess fuel to burn. Well, instead of playing games with a second stage, if you could actually motor the, uh, that second stage over to a fuel depot and sell it to the government at a set price, well, that would be a nice way to add some profit onto, uh, onto that launch. So there are a number of enablers there. Um, if you want to go to destinations beyond LEO. So there we are in 2017 with, uh, with the depots. <clears throat> There's also uh, some real advantage of having depots closer to the moon. And uh, real briefly, if you're at L1, you're essentially the high ground uh, from a potential well standpoint uh, with regard to any location on the moon. And so if you have a depot at the uh, Lagrange point L1, you essentially can get global lunar access. So it, it provides a really important infrastructure element to be able to operate easily uh, on the moon, both to get to the moon as well as, as, as returning home. So there we are in 2018. Excuse me. <clears throat> 2019. Um, with the advancement in teleoperation and autonomous capabilities that we use every day, uh, over the skies of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, we believe that we will see a number of opportunities to pursue uh, teleoperated uh, and autonomous activities on the moon in this time frame. And one thing that could be uh, accomplished is put in place the infrastructure, habitats, landing sites, power, and so on, to allow uh, human habitation. And so a, a little bit differently than how we did Apollo, instead of having the astronauts go up front and with a lot of risk involved, essentially let the robots lead the way, put in place the infrastructure, essentially have a, uh, have a guaranteed habitat and return home capability um, before you try to send people. And again, um, this is something with advanced teleoperations we believe is, is very doable. So there we are in 2019. And one thing about 2019, that happens to be the 50th anniversary of Apollo. And uh, so I'm sure on, on that date, people were, will be asking the question, well, what have we done in the 50 years since Apollo? And so having something, some significant activity on the moon at that point in time, I think would be a fitting uh, tribute to, uh, to the accomplishments of Apollo. Then what do we do after that? Okay, well, we need to put in place human transportation between the Earth and the moon. And keep in mind, if we had roughly 2014, 2015 that we were doing commercial transport to low Earth orbit, that essentially gives you five additional years to put in place the uh, transportation capability for both cis-lunar uh, and eventually lunar surface. Obviously, for the lunar surface, then you have to have a landing and launch capability. That gives you five years to put those capabilities in place. So there we are at 2020. And then, potentially, 2022, if all the pieces are in place, you could look at uh, returning humans to the moon. And nice thing about 2022, that's the 50th anniversary of the last man on the moon. So again, it would be a fitting tribute that uh, 50 years since the last person on the moon that you returned to the moon. But then we want to go farther. And uh, if we look at fuel depots in other locations, such as L2, and also have the development of in situ resource utilizations. So now you can be looking at using lunar resources for fuel, for, for water, for life support, for things that you want to do beyond the moon. Um, there could be considerable savings. And actually, there have been some studies 
that have looked at that. Right now, there are significant uncertainties, I guess I would say, relative to the cost effectiveness of using lunar resources versus taking resources from the Earth. But assuming that you get economies of scale and also uh, develop the capabilities as you would expect if you've operated on, on the lunar surface for, for roughly 10 years, um, I think there's a, a number of opportunities to have uh, significant savings in the costs to get resources from the moon to go to places beyond. So there we are, 2024. And then we come to 2025, and here we are, you know, potentially at the point of crude voyages beyond the moon. And these can be to asteroids, uh, to the moons of Mars. Uh, once you have the infrastructure in place where you can operate on the moon as well as uh, move beyond the moon, now the, the door is open to lots of different destinations, given the interest and the value of going to those, to those destinations at the time. So there we are in 2025. And then 2030, potentially landing people on Mars. And again, that is the, uh, one of the big goals that has been laid um, on NASA from President Obama, you could turn people to, to Mars. And I think in this build scheme that we've, that we've laid out, you'd be looking roughly at 2030 to do that. Um, we know, for example, that, uh, that Elon is quite interested in doing this. In fact, he's designed his whole Falcon 9 Dragon system, including the launch escape system, to actually act as a decelerator to potentially allow it, the Dragon capsule to decelerate and land on Mars. I mean, that was one of, the, one of his intentions behind his design of his, uh, his Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy and his Dragon system. So we're you know, looking potentially at 2030, you know, might, might it be possible to actually have people on Mars at that time? So here we are then at 2030. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out in this is that you look at all the different activities that could be in place by 2030, and there's a whole range of different, different uh, things that could be happening, a lot of exciting opportunity. And what I want to just point out is that right now, most of our attention is focused here on launch vehicles, and the ISS, and that's understandable, but look at all the other things we could, could be involved with um, if we move forward, I think, in a, in a sensible way. And then you can look at a couple different pathways that, this, that such a scenario I've just laid out to you provides. One is a human pathway. Right now we have the ISS, and that can provide uh, essentially a, a duration capability. How, what is, how do we have people living in space for long durations? But what we want to be able to do then is move from being able to have people in space for long durations in low Earth orbit, uh, first with, with government capabilities and private capabilities, but eventually moving on to places like the moon and then points beyond and then on, on to Mars. There's also a transportation pathway. Okay, what's the path, what is the transportation infrastructure that allows uh, these activities? And again, it starts off with launch vehicles to get to low Earth orbit, and then capsules and other systems to get people back uh, from orbit back to the, to the surface. Fuel depots that provide an important infrastructure uh, for in-space operation, space tugs to take things from low Earth orbit to other locations, uh, lunar landers and uh, lunar lifters to take you to the lunar surface and off the lunar surface, and then to points beyond. the commercial par partnerships pathway. And this is a very important part of this whole scenario. This is assuming that you have significant commercial partnerships along the way. This is not a, a government-only activity. This is the government working collaboratively with commercial space industry, similar to how we built our whole aviation industry, okay, that the government worked very collaboratively through the NACA with uh, the aviation industry to build a whole new industry. And so there's there is a tremendous opportunity for commercial participation in this type of a scenario. And then this is, I think, uh, exceedingly important, the near-term Earth benefits pathway, because there needs to be benefits back to, uh, to the taxpayers, people footing the bill for this as, as you move along. And uh, again, there's a number of ways that we believe benefits will return to Earth uh, from these types of activities, from understanding aging, to helping to uh, um, solve some terrible illnesses like kidney failure, uh, to coming up with new materials that can, can have a uh, you know, dramatic impact on energy usage, energy storage, and so on. There's, there's a whole range of different 
challenges that we face right now on Earth that I believe activities such as these will help provide solutions for. So again, how things stand today, here's where we're at. How things could stand, say, in the 2022 time frame. And the bottom line on this is 21st century jobs and careers. What will be the 21st century jobs and careers that uh, people in this audience, younger folks in this audience, my 15-year-old son, um, will, will be pursuing in this time frame? And uh, many of us who have been in the aerospace industry for some time will obviously be watching from the sidelines or from the world beyond in 2022. But it's important for, for people um, who are looking at their careers now, okay, where do they want to go, to have some idea of what can they shoot for. And I think uh, space activities and the whole panoply of different possibilities out there uh, could provide a very fertile ground for, for 21st century jobs and careers. And then I think most important, as we look further out, what are the opportunities we have for a prosperous future as a nation? And I think that's a really a, an important question that we need to answer right now. And I'm a firm believer that with serious development and activity in space, we actually will lay the framework for a prosperous, prosperous future uh, for our country. So, uh, so I'm very pleased to uh, be part of helping to move this along and uh, very pleased to have, have uh, um, very heartfelt people who come in on a Saturday morning to listen to these things to, to help make it happen. And with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. So first, I, questions from the audience? Yes. You just want to run the microphone? So uh, looking into the future, um, when you start seeing people go to the moon and uh, start settling there, uh, do you have a prediction for how many nations are going to be settling on the moon around the same time period? I think that this is a, uh, going to be fundamentally an international endeavor, very similar, I think, to the International Space Station. And so if you want to have uh, something as a benchmark, we have 16 countries involved with the International Space Station. So I guess I would say at least 16, and, uh, but likely more. I think that uh, uh, for a whole host of reasons, as the world gets more global, gets more connected, um, the fact that the no one country I, has the resources to do all of what I showed there on their own, that this is going to be a fundamentally a global endeavor. So I would imagine many nations will be involved. I want to say thanks, Dan. That was uh, a really good, um, more, the most fleshed out presentation of the future and economic opportunities that I've seen. Um, in a while. Um, yesterday we saw a, a really good talk from Hoyt Davidson on uh, the commercial space industry and suggestions for NASA's, what NASA can do to support that. Um, so I'm going to ask, how are we going to make this happen? Um, he had some suggestions like additional SBIR levels, extending centennial challenges, and so on and so forth. Um, have, has the space portal given thought to what NASA very can Very much, do? yeah, very much. I, I think the, the most important thing that NASA needs to do is rediscover the NACA. And if you take a look at the NACA, this was very much a success model for building an industry. Started in 1915 through 1958, built an entire industry, which was exceedingly important, both to national security as well as our economic uh, prosperity. And that, there is the model, and I think that's still in our genes here at NASA Ames. Many of you may know that there were four NACA research centers. Ames was number two, uh, Langley was the first one, and we had uh, Glenn and Dryden. But I think that one of the most important things is for NASA to rediscover that, how you work collaboratively uh, with, with uh, both traditional and emerging companies. Again, it's something that we've done here at NASA Ames um, through our whole history. Uh, in part because we were birthed as an NACA center. Um, but it's something we need to discover more. There are still certain things that, it's, that NASA is going to need to take the lead on, okay? Things that have no real commercial market or opportunity behind them. Um, you know, the, the, the high frontier type activities, that's where NASA needs to have more of what we call the Apollo model, where you have essentially kind of a, a government-funded and directed activity. But for a lot of the things that actually I just showed here, 
I mean, it's going to be much more, in my opinion, of an NACA type approach that will really make it happen. David. Anything over here? Yeah, Dan, I wonder if you had uh, any thoughts about opportunities for reuse of, of hardware. You know, of course, we, we tend to throw everything away after a, a use with a few exceptions, like the, the Orbiter and the SRBs. But right. It seems like, you know, there's always debate about, you know, tugs, can you slow them down? Can you, can you do anything to deep space hab? Can you, can you put it back in an orbit where you could service it and reuse right. it? Uh, other places, maybe you could repurpose hardware after its first mission. Just what's your thoughts right. on that? Um, most hardware, if it's used frequently enough, um, you can make an economic case for reuse. And there's actually a, a chapter in the Office of the Chief Technologist Technology Roadmaps on low-cost, reliable access to space, and we get, we get directly at this reuse question. And it turns out that the major impediment to reuse is more economic than technical. What I mean by that, you have to have a reason to reuse something very many times before it pays for itself to be reusable. And take a look at anything we reuse in our lives, our automobiles, our airplanes. We use them you know, hundreds and thousands of times. Uh, most space hardware to date we use very inf infrequently. So if you're using something very infrequently, then it gets very hard for it to be economically viable to be reusable. But once you use something very, very frequently, now it becomes economically viable for it to be reusable, and then it's easy to much easier to bring the technologies into play to make that happen. So. Um, I think that as this goes forward, as we use space more routinely, we're going to see more and more reusability of all the elements that go into it, including the launch systems and in-space systems and so on. But it really comes down to the, the usability. How, how often do we need to use this? And if we're using it infrequently, then I think it will stay as it currently is. Anybody over on this side? <clears throat> on, on the reusability, um, one essentially goes first for mass like propellants, but then reusing with very little modification and then reusing by uh, getting some simple structural elements from extraterrestrial materials and, and it's a whole set of process. So there needs to be a roadmap for that too. So what scenarios in the time frame you're given are there for the, these types of progressive steps to making, you know, fairly complicated stuff uh, by pulling elements from the moon, from the earth, from reuse, et cetera. Well, see, I'm a, a big believer in the, in the free market. So I think that if we can bring in commercial enterprise and people have seen an opportunity to make a profit by uh, providing services and capabilities that are needed, uh, that you will see these things naturally come about. And I think, again, looking back at NACA, that's essentially the route. We did not have a, ground, a grand roadmap for NACA. What we had was, I think, a important philosophy on how the government needed to work with private industry so that both benefited. And so I think it's much more about a philosophy of working together collaboratively, and then you take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves. I'm like to say right now, one opportunity is fuel depots. I think that uh, that's a huge opportunity both for NASA and for commercial enterprise to uh, do that and, and to significantly improve our capabilities to do things in space and at the same time provide avenues for people to make money uh, at providing that service. I've got a couple written questions here. Let me, before we run out of time, let me just see if I can get to them. Uh, do we still have the Project M in place to put R2 on the moon within 1,000 days? Um, I'll ask one of my JSC colleagues if, Dave, do you want to speak to that? I, I'm not sure what the official status is on M2, I'll be honest with you. I, I know about it, or Project M. I think it had a, a lot of interesting prospects. I don't know what the official status is on, on Project M. I'm sorry? I think that's right. Uh, Steve Altimus, I believe, was leading that out of JSC, and I think he got a cease and desist order on it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, let me get the next one. Uh, NASA and its employees are old. So true. Actually, funny story, real briefly. Um, the day I got promoted to be a senior scientist, my 13-year-old daughter looked at me and said, Dad, that just means you're old. And so <laughs> it's true. Okay. What paradigm shift do you anticipate uh, with a younger generation taking the more leadership positions in the administration? Um, very good question. I, again, my, my touchstone on this is my 15-year-old son, okay? And uh, the big paradigm shift that I see uh, from that generation is massive participation. They want to do it, okay? They don't want to watch someone else do this, okay? They want to be involved themselves. 
and, uh, and they're used to that. They're used to the world they live in is a massive participation world. And so it's how can they be part of the design, part of the operations, part of the experiments. I think that's one of the biggest paradigm shifts that we're going to see uh, coming through in space. And I'm, I'm hoping that the, uh, the administration backs that as well. And are we about out of time here, Dan? <laughs> any, any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for your time. Future can hold. And I'm reminded that uh, it was actually during the Civil War that the Transcontinental Railroad got put in place. So when you have times of turbulence, there's actually t um, moments of opportunity. So I'm, I'm hoping we can speak to that. So the next big thing I want to talk about is a flexible path to Mars with commercial opportunity and public benefits along the way. And this is actually a, a direction that we've gotten from President Obama, uh, the NASA authorization of through, the, through new space commercial industry. And what is the future once we get there? What's the promise that new space holds? That's what today's focus will be on. What, it, what is our goals? To begin today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Rasky, the director of the NASA Ames Space Portal. Dr. Rasky is, uh, is the senior scientist at NASA and, the head of, as I mentioned, the director of the Space Portal. He's the co-founder of it as well. The Space Portal has the goal of being a friend, friendly front door to emerging and non-traditional space companies here at NASA Ames, focusing on, of course, making it more savvy, more getting the connection between NASA and emerging space much stronger. So without further ado, Dr. Dan Rasky. Thank you, Dan, and uh, welcome everyone to a Saturday morning here. It's nice to see all the true believers on a bright Saturday morning. And I'm, of course, particularly pleased to see Pete Warden has made time to, to be here. So I've got to be on my best behavior, so I'll, I'll try to do the best that I can. Um, what I wanted to talk about is the next big thing. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, several of my co-authors on this, Lynn Harper, uh, Bruce Pittman, who many of you know, and also Mark Newfield. And uh, what I want to do today, and particularly in the context of our current national um, situation that there's shuttle program has ended, uh, there's a certain amount of distress about a debt ceiling, is to try to put something on the table of a, a potential, I think, attractive future. Because uh, it's times like this, it's easy to lose sight of what the future is. but also what's going to be of the future. There's a vision that's going to be, that we're going towards from what are our next destinations? How are we going to get there? What, is our, what are we going to do when we get there? How do we make it possible to settle? How do we enable, how do we improve the science we have